Hi, I'm Ayn Grit Havanasin. And I'm Rifat Khan. And we are PhD students at the University of Cambridge. Welcome to episode one of Black Hole Wars, Cause and No Effect. In this episode, we're going to learn about the original formulations of black hole information paradox by Stephen Hawkins. In 1973 to 75, Stephen Hawking and Jacob Bekenstein showed that black holes should slowly radiate away energy, which led to the famed information paradox. Here to tell us about what black holes are is Professor Christopher Reynolds, the Plumian Professor of Astronomy and Experimental Philosophy at the Institute of Astronomy here at the University of Cambridge. Thank you. Pleasure to be here and thank you for the nice introduction. Um, so let me share some slides and I can um, explain to you the basics of, of what black holes are. So black holes um, are created when you have the sort of overwhelming victory of um, gravity over other forces. So imagine, for example, the core of a star, which is about to, which is in the process of dying. So the core of the star will implode. It is possible to be in a situation where gravity can overwhelm every other force, and all that matter will be collapsing down to um, ostensibly, we believe, a point. So what I'm going to be des describing right here is sort of the very classical theory of black holes that dates back to, to Einstein um, and is sort of gonna form the foundation of the problem we'll be talking about in, in, in all of these sessions. So you have uh, this region that collapses down to a point, we call that point space-time singularity, which is a fancy way of saying our equa equations break at that point. Um, but uh, in the classical theory, as you get closer and closer to this point, gravity becomes stronger and stronger. And if you're close enough, there's no escaping from it. You know, you will inevitably be pulled into that point and even a light beam will inevitably be pulled into that, into that point. So there's a region surrounding this um, that's the point of no return. You know, if you're inside of here, then everything will get pulled in, including light. Outside of here, in principle, you can escape. You know, a light beam can escape or a sufficiently fast rocket, rocket can escape. So this is called the event horizon, you know, the point of no, no return. Um, so this is a very classical picture of black hole. And you know, if we sort of paint on what you might see, if you were looking at this um, in the universe, you would, you would see something like this. Of course, the effect of gravity doesn't stop the event horizon. It, 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 it extends what, you know, well outside, and it can distort our view of, um, of the background stars and the background galaxies. So, so that, that's in essence what, um, what our, our classical view of a black hole is. So let's say if I jump into a black hole, will, will I know when I'm actually crossing this event horizon? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so again, according to this classical theory from, from Einstein, the answer is actually no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice. One good analogy for the event horizon is you know, these giant sinkholes that you get in reservoirs. Um, so imagine that you were swimming around in this, in this reservoir, there would be a point where the flow of water you know, towards a sinkhole was faster than the, the speed you could swim at. You wouldn't even, but you wouldn't know when you crossed that point, that would make you know, this very dangerous, um, but you wouldn't know it when you crossed that point. All you would know is eventually you'd be swept inwards and, and um, would fall in. So again, in the classical you know, Einstein's um, notion of, of a black hole, that is uh, the nature of this event horizon. It's that point of no return, but you could actually cross over it without even really realizing it. And do you think such objects actually exist in the real world? Well, this has been a focus of, astronom of astronomers' work for a long time, you know, looking for evidence for black holes and trying to, to, to make that evidence stronger and stronger. The, um, you know, the, the, you might have thought looking for a black hole was was like this uh, cart Sydney Harris cartoon describes it to be, which is you know looking for a um, the absence of, of of something. 
in fact, you couldn't couldn't be far further from the truth. You know, black holes actually, um, we believe, power some of the most luminous objects in the um, in the universe. If you were to stare out in the universe um, with an X-ray telescope, and that's that's what this picture is from. This picture is from the Chandra um, X-ray Observatory. Every point you're seeing here is, it's not a star. Every point you're seeing, we believe, is powerful X-ray emission from um, the near vicinity of supermassive black holes in this cores of, cores of galaxies. And the, the way that works is that, you know, if we're just having a cartoon, imagine zooms in on one of those little points of light, the way we work that this works is we believe that matter is falling into a black hole is you know, because of the gravity is falling down a hole basically. Um, as it does that, it gives up its gravitational energies, you know, formally it gives up its gravitational potential energy. And that energy is liberated as, as you know, light or as kinetic energy of material coming out of it. Um, the key thing is though, because the gravity in the black hole is so strong and the, you know, it's such a deep hole, this is an extremely efficient process. And you know, our calculations suggest that if we drop a kilogram of matter into, into black holes, um, into a black hole, we can release an enormous amount of energy, the equivalent of a, of a two megaton um, you know, TNT bomb. So this is extremely efficient, much more efficient than, than thermonuclear fusion. So this in fact gives, means astronomers can actually study black holes um, you know, very well because we can, we can look at the light coming from them. So something that was being, being done for quite some time in, in, um, in astronomy is to use X-ray mission to study, study these black holes as I described. And just one example of the kind of thing we can do is we can look at the uh, spectrum of the X-rays. In other words, the, the, the amount of X-rays coming as a, uh, as a function of the energy of the X-rays. And one of the things we find are features like this in the, in the spectrum. Now, what you're looking at here is um, there's a spike in the spectrum at this, uh, this energy right here, which corresponds to glowing iron. You know, there's a very particular energy where um, iron is glowing. This, this is traces of iron in that orbiting gas around the black hole. And um, if it wasn't, if it was just simply you know, iron glowing, it would just be a very sharp spike at the spectrum here. But what you can see in this in this uh, slide is that there's a long tail to this to this line, a long tail to this feature. And what you're seeing here are actually um, X rays that have been emitted by this glowing iron that have had to climb their way out of um, the very very deep gravity well of the black hole. So this is technically called gravitational redshift. Um, and it's very strong. I mean, uh, they've had to climb their way out of this very, very deep um, gravitational potential well to form, to form this, um, uh, th this feature. So the, we believe this is evidence for orbiting gas very close to a black hole. So Chris, there are other um, very compact objects in astrophysics, such as neutron stars and stuff. Um, why uh, couldn't they be the ones um, giving off these X-ray emissions? That's a great question. Yeah, in, in, indeed. Actually, if we look at neutron stars, which are also have matter accreting onto them, we see similar features to this, except a much less extreme. You know, we see we see slightly slightly um, redshifted features. Um, if we look at this particular case, which is we believe is a supermassive black hole, you have this very extreme. So one answer is that. Um, it's the extreme nature of the signal we're seeing. The, the other answer to that is uh, somewhat a process of elimination. You know, we can, we can, a black hole model fits these data. We start to ask, well, does it have to be a black hole? What else could fit, could fit the, this kind of picture? And um, you start to, to try to calculate other possibilities. And at least within what I would call standard physics, uh, you run out of options. You know, so for example, in, in this um, uh, case, we believe that this is a very, very massive object, you know, a, a, a 10 million solar mass object um, in the center of, this, center of this galaxy. And um, you couldn't actually have a neutron star that big. You know, any, any physical theory would tell you the neutron star would then collapse in on itself if it was that, if it was that massive. 
there are other um, slightly more exotic objects called boson stars, where you you know you you hypothesize some new particle that could coalesce into into a massive object. In fact, though, our calculations of boson stars would suggest that they're not compact enough either to to give us these strong this very strong gravitational potential well that you would need to, to give us these features. Now, is there something else that we're missing that we can't we haven't yet calculated yet? Maybe um, the, the this is one of the, from, from astronomers' point of view, one of the curious aspects of a black hole. Of course, is it's defined by the absence of something, and that that can make it a bit difficult to to say absolutely is a black hole versus some other possibility. Um, one thing I would pick up on though, and the question of, of of do black holes really exist, is you know these are these are X-ray studies which are which um, many of us have been engaged in for some, some time. In more recent times, there's been um, other ways we could look at look at black holes. So one of them is to look at the so the, the gravitational waves that come when two black holes merge, and this has been a, a, a big, um, the huge progress in this in just the past past five years. And this was the discovery plot. You know, this is the the discovery data of uh, gravitational waves for which actually the Nobel Prize was given. Um, what you're seeing here are the signals from two gravitational wave detectors in the US, one in Washington state and one in Louisiana. And you are seeing the, the wave form here um, in these two detectors. What you're actually seeing are waves in space time itself. You're seeing ripples in space time as two black holes, which are orbiting around each other are merging. Um, and as they come closer and closer to merger, the signal gets stronger and stronger, and then um, and then they merge and, and everything settles down. So this top one is the actual data. This this middle panel here is a model that would that fits that data quite well. Um, again, this fits the expectation for black holes extremely well. In particular, if there wasn't an event horizon there, if these were just those singularities orbiting around each other. Um, the signal would would go faster and faster and faster and, and become stronger and stronger as it went in, rather than nicely cutting off like this. So this fits the expectations for black holes um, extremely well. And then just the final thing I'll point out is that um, uh, this, yeah, as I said, this gives this gave us Nobel Prize in 2017. Um, the final thing I'd say is that um, in recent uh, times we've now actually been able to take an, a real image of the immediate environment of a black hole. Um, and in fact, this has just been in the, in the news um, just a few days ago. Uh, so this is from the so-called Event Horizon Telescope, which is a global array of radio telescopes that can act in concert and can give us extremely high resolution, or in other words, extremely sharp images of, um, of nearby black holes. And this is a black hole in a nearby galaxy, M87, which is a, a large, a, a giant elliptical galaxy nearby. And so what you are seeing here is glowing um, emission, glowing in the radio, radio band. This is, um, you know, it's, it's glowing because the gas is hot, basically. But the, the, the hole in the middle here, we believe, really is that event horizon, that you're seeing a hole there because there's an event horizon there. Um, and the, 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 the news from this week was that they saw signals in those radio data uh, called polarization, uh, which um, told us that the gas that secreted, that, that's falling into the black hole is strongly magnetized. And this is actually an important part of understanding how the gas actually falls in is through those magnetic fields. So Chris, I think a natural question is uh, to, uh, that anybody would ask is, what is this glow outside the black hole? Um, I'm assuming that it's not Hawking radiation, is it? So that's right. It's not Hawking radiation. As we'll hear from the next speaker, Hawking radiation becomes you know colder and colder, and and therefore less and less luminous. The bigger the black holes we're talking about, there's a little bit counterintuitive, but really big black holes have very weak Hawking radiation. So pretty much all the black holes, in fact, that we we study as an, as astronomers. We believe the Hawking radiation is um, is not relevant for the emission that we're seeing. Um, now, it's not to say it's not relevant for physics. It is highly relevant for physics, but it's not relevant for the emission that we, we are seeing here. Now, in this particular case, what we believe is, is happening is that this is hot and magnetized gas. 
And in, in such gas, there's a process you get called synchrotron radiation, basically because you have the electrons and the gas are spiraling around the magnetic fields and doing that, they release, um, they, they emit radio waves. So that's what we, that's what we believe is, is happening here. Okay, so I mean, now, now, we've, now we've sort of mentioned the idea of, of Hawking radiation. Um, this actually does lead us nicely to the statement of um, the information paradox or one statement of the information paradox. And let me just sort of introduce it in very simple terms um, in the following way. And we'll hear much more detail about this from, from um, subsequent speakers. So here we have a black hole. Suppose we take something that has information in. So for example, a good book like, like Hitchhiker's Guide. And um, we throw that book into the black hole. So the classical theory, you know, Einstein's theory tells you that black hole from our point of view outside the universe passes over the event horizon and um, it, that the information in that book is lost to us. We'll never be able to get it back. Now, um, there's you know, the other pillar of physics. One pillar is Einstein's theory of general relativity that tells us how gravity works. The other pillar of physics is quantum theory. And quantum theory tells you that you can never destroy information. That, you know, you, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll hear a more technical phrasing of that statement in the next talk. But, but quantum theory basically tells you you can never destroy information. So um, how does this work? Well, th this wouldn't be a problem if the black hole was a lockbox that you could just put information in and say, well, it's not destroyed, but you're just not getting it out. Um, and if that was a lockbox forever, that would, be, that would be fine. The problem is that because of Hawking radiation, that's not true. Hawking radiation tells you that over a sufficiently long time, the black hole will um, emit energy because it's emitting energy, it'll lose energy and it will actually shrink. And as it, uh, as it shrinks away, there'll be a little flash of Hawking radiation um, and then the black hole's gone, again, according to the classical, classical theory. So then the information is gone. So that's the problem, that, that in this classical theory that we've talked about, you could throw a book in there you've locked that information in the black hole, but then the black hole evaporates and where's the information gone? You know, um, quantum theory tells you it can't have disappeared, but we don't know where it's gone. So that, that's, the, that's the classic problem that um, has got a lot of people very, uh, very engaged. So Chris, I have a question. Regarding the formation of a black hole, you said in the end it forms when gravity overtakes and Vince, why is that the case? Why can't, why is there nothing that prevents from it happening? And from what object that does these black holes form? Well, that, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, there's, there's four fundamental forces in the universe. Gravi gravity is one of them. Um, there's you know, two nuclear forces, the weak and strong nuclear force, which are very short range forces. And then there's electromagnetism. And um, the question is, you know, in certain settings, why can gravity overwhelm, overwhelm all of those? Well, it's a very powerful force when you start to have a lot of matter together. It's always attractive. Um, so the more and more matter you have, the stronger and the more strongly attractive it gets. Whereas electromagnetism, because you have both positive and negative charges, you know, sometimes it's attractive, sometimes it's repulsive, and those effects tend to cancel out when you have large enough amounts of matter. Um, so, so broadly, that's one reason why gravity always wins, is that if you have enough matter, it always acts in concert in the same, the same direction, and it, 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 it crushes and can overwhelm other forces. In, in more detail, you know, in, for example, the core of a collapsing star, um, the problem you know, arises when uh, the star runs out of, of fuel, so it can no longer make, make energy um, through nuclear fusion. When that happens, the core of the star tends to be basically a big ball of iron because um, the nuclear fusion process has run up to iron. And, um, and then that ball of iron has enormous weight of star, star pushing, down, pushing down on it. And when the, um, when that weight gets, gets large enough, then it will, uh, again, gravity will, will always win. It will crush down. Um, 
it could try to hang up a little bit when you've pushed the nuclei in that so close together that the nuclei start to overlap. Um, I mean, in principle, that's how a neutron star is formed. A neutron star is formed when the forces between nuclei that are starting to touch is strong enough to, to counteract gravity. Um, and there's a, there's a, for a while, you can actually hang an object up at that point. You know, the, the forces between nuclei, when nuclei start to touch each other, is strong enough that you can actually hold it up. But if you have a big enough object that's got enough gravity pulling on it, then even that force can be overcome and you'll, you'll crush all the way down to, to, there's nothing then left, you crush all the way down to a black hole. Um, so that's, that's the case of a star. Now you also asked, uh, you know, are there other kinds of objects where black holes can form? And that's a really good question. You know, the, there's, there's broadly two classes of black holes we know about. One are, uh, as astronomers that we know about, one, one are the so-called stellar mass black holes, which we think come from the collapse of the cores of stars. And they typically have masses in, that are 10 or 20 times the mass of the sun. But then we also know about you know, real monster black holes, sort of supermassive black holes that are the cores of galaxies. And those have masses you know, between anything between a billion to, sorry, a million to a billion, or we've even seen 10 billion solar times mass of our sun. And um, where those come from is actually still a bit of a mystery. You know, the, the, there, must be, there must have been processes uh, when the universe was young, when galaxies were in the process of coming together, by which you know, huge amounts of gas collapsed in on itself to form those, form those black holes. They, uh, one idea is that they may have formed basically giant star-like things, you know, not really stars, but, but sort of stars that were millions of times more massive than the sun. And then those stars collapsed into, collapsed into black holes. Um, but that's still an ongoing question of, of how those really supermassive black holes uh, formed. So, as you said, supermassive black holes, um, they don't really radiate um, uh, Hawking radiation as much. So, in a way, we're lucky because these sort of building blocks of galaxies and our universe as a whole um, don't, won't be disappearing on us anytime soon. <laughs> right. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. The, the, the universe would probably be a very different place if these black holes were, were evaporating away and dis dis disappearing. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, it's not, it's not, of course, not to say that Hawking radiation isn't important for the physics of a black hole, it really is. It's one of the, so it's an interesting, interesting conundrum, if you like, or interesting um, uh, aspect of this, of this problem that when as an astronomer, you're studying black holes, this classical theory we've talked about is actually perfectly sufficient because the um, evaporation of a black hole that, that I mentioned and we'll hear about a lot more is actually such a slow process that you'd have to wait for you know, many, many, many times the age of our universe before it became important. Um, so, so as a practical point of view, as an astronomer, we don't have to worry about it, but of course it's, um, it's central to our understanding of, of, of the actual physics of the black holes, you know, how nature actually works. Thank you, Chris, for uh, a great introduction into black holes and the, the context in astrophysics. Well, thank you. It's been, it's been a pleasure. And um, yeah, enjoy, enjoy the rest of the session. So that was a great talk by Chris. And now we have uh, Chandramoli Chowdhury from International Center for Theoretical Sciences, Bangalore, to talk about the quantum aspects of black holes and information. All right. So uh, thank you for the great introduction. And uh, I'll now maybe try and share my slides. I should thank uh, Ayn Garden for this invitation to speak on this event. It's, it's wonderful. And let me try and tell you in the next few minutes about what um, about some of the things that were teased at the end of the uh, previous lecture. So, right, I'll mostly be talking about these uh, these six topics. Firstly, there's something called absence of many hairs. Um, I'll explain what that means. Then I'll tell you what really information means. I'm sure you've all heard of the term called information paradox. But uh, it's, it's, you know, as often happens, we don't really define what information means and then I'm going to try and do that. And then I'll explain to you what Hawking radiation is. And finally, to build up to the information paradox again, I have to take a small detour and tell you what unitarity is in quantum mechanics. All of these might sound fancy right now, but at the end, you'll see that it's really very simple and it can all be explained in one or two sentences. And in the end, I'll 
try and tell you some ideas of um, how people have been uh, thinking about attacking the problem. And um, I think you'll hear a lot more about point six on uh, in, 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 the, in the upcoming talks. Okay, so the first thing to summarize the talk by Chris, um, in fact, I'm using the same picture which you had in his slides. The, one of the striking dis distinctions between a black hole and almost any other object that we know of is the presence of a horizon for a black hole. Uh, I think Chris defined it as the event horizon. So I'm just calling it the horizon, it means the same thing. This is equivalent to the radius of a black hole. It just, it's, it's, in this picture, you can just think of it as uh, this point. As Chris described, um, this small region in here through which there's no light coming out, that is something that you can think of as the event horizon. And it's the same point through which if you once pass classically, you'll not actually know that you've already uh, you know, fallen into the black hole and that you can never get out. <clears throat> However, I should mention there's a, a caveat to the statement and the word classically is very important. There are ways in which by using the principles of quantum mechanics, you can recover information back. And that's been a subject of research in the last seven years, especially in the last seven years. It's, it's been a question that was posed after uh, Hawking's original paradox in 1973. But uh, I think you'll hear a lot more about these kind of things in the next few slides. Uh, I mean, from the, from the next few um, uh, speakers. Okay, so now let me talk about something which is uh, traditionally called the no hair theorem. And no hair is nothing fancy. It, in a slight technical language, it just, it, it, it just means something called degrees of freedom. Um, and in a boiled down version, it's something which just parameterizes a system. So if you have to parameterize any system, you have to specify some properties of it. For example, if you have to parameterize a room, you have to tell its length, breadth, and height. Similarly, if you have to parameterize some other objects, say a, 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 a point particle which is moving, you have to parameterize its position and velocity. And you can, and, and <laughs> there exist similar parameters with which you can uh, talk about a black hole. And these include the mass, the charge, and angular momentum of it. Mass is very similar to the weight that you are all familiar with. Charge is uh, the simplest kind of charge that we're all used to is the electric charge. And it's, it's something that we all see in school about elect electrons repelling each other, and electron and the positron being attracted. So that's the basic meaning of charge. And angular momentum is just a fancy word for how fast the object is rotating. In other words, it just tells you how fast the object is spinning or the spin of the uh, particle. So if you have a black hole, it can just sit over there and not move at all. That's the that's that's a black hole which has zero angular momentum. And but if it starts rotating about its axis, then that's a black hole with an angular momentum. So the idea from the no hair theorem, which can be proved using some concepts of uh, uh, general relativity, is that um, all you need to do in order to specify what a black hole is is to tell what its mass, charge, and angular momentum are. And a quick way of understanding what's happening in here is that um, you, you can think of this image as, again, some, some sort of a, uh, something which makes these day-to-day -day life objects collapse and form a black hole. And the idea is that no matter what you start with, you just end up getting the final, uh, final uh, state of the system as a black hole that just has these three properties. So it doesn't matter if you started with some flowers or you started with the table, you can assume that a flower and the table has same mass, some big, big flower or something. And um, once they collapse, they might just have the same mass and you'll not be able to tell what exactly collapsed into the black hole. So that's the classical version of the no hair theorem that you're all familiar with. Are there any questions at this point? Yeah, Chandavali. Um so what if I want to describe the system with quantum mechanics, and then I would be using some degrees of freedom that like the quantum versions of that. Uh, do you also uh, have a quantum version of the neo theorem? Well, I, 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 think, I think the correct answer to that is, uh, I mean, okay, there's, there's one answer to that, which is just no, and uh, end of story. But, 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 then, but, then, but then one can actually expand upon that answer and describe why it is no. So, um, you, you can think of, I mean, again, when you say quantum degrees of freedom, you have to be very, you have, you have to really specify what you mean. 
So for example, you have to say whether you're thinking about the quantum as being the you know, quantum gravitational theory, like are you thinking of gravity itself as a quantum object now and then want to associate some sort of gravitation in the quantum gravitational degrees of freedom to these objects. Then, then I think some recent research by uh, some people actually show that it might be possible to describe more than just these things. That is, if you, if you want to think of these as not just very definite values, but you want to think of them as some quantized values, like, you know, you, 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 you might want to think of mass as some quantum version of something, the angular momentum as some quantum version of something. And then as it often happens in quantum mechanics, you end up making many measurements in order to realize what this thing is. I'll talk a bit more about this in the upcoming slides. But uh, if you promote the notion of a no hat theorem to include those kind of things, then indeed you end up getting more information than just these three. And I think it will be um, given a lot more explanation on these in the upcoming talks. Tandamuli, uh, we know that in um, uh, physics, uh, whether it's classical or quantum, that um, part the particles around us um, have more than just these properties. So like in quantum physics, we even have this weird uh, thing called color charge and stuff. So what happens to all these? Good. Um, so, I mean, here, here when I'm using the word charge, I'm using it in a very broad sense. Um, although I did mention that this is only taking care of electric charge, but that's, that's because I didn't want to make it more complicated. But in principle, you can also have color charges and those that also come under this word charge. So even if you, like you could parameterize a black hole by just using some color charge and so on, that's also fine. But, but, then, but then the only, only important thing which, uh, which, which goes in is that all of these are just thought of as very definitive values. That if a black hole had started out with mass 10 power 100 kgs, then that's it, that's the value of its mass. You're not going to do some probabilistic measurement to measure what mass is. But and similarly for the other quantum numbers, um, and and that's that's the only important thing in the classical no hat here. Okay, so uh, no more questions. Let's go on to the next slide. As promised, I'll talk about what I mean by information. In uh, I mean what's in, at least important for us. For anyone who has spent some time in physics, they know that very soon you come across very many many different um, meanings of the word information. But in here, we just are talking about the simplest thing that comes to mind when you say, when you utter the word information. And in here, that just means the initial state of the system. So the system can be as simple as some chair, which falls in, or it can even be some string of alphabets written on a paper. You can, you, you, let's say you just took two different identical papers, but uh, in one of them, you wrote the word alpha, and the other one, you wrote the word beta. Then um, the point is that, after the object falls, uh, forms a black hole, and we don't care how it, you know, how it does that. We just assume that there's some kind of heavy force which is compressing it and making it form. That's that's all you. Uh, that's all that's important for us. The um, but but let's say once it does form a black hole, the information about the color of the object or even you know the words which were written on the paper just disappears off. All that is finally left for you is the mass or the angular momentum or the charge of the object. So if you had a paper which was uncharged then and it was not rotating, so the only thing that would be left with would be the mass. Um, of course, it's not, it's, it's not practically possible to do that with such a small object, but in principle, of course, you can. And being a theorist, we always live in this domain when we think of thought experiments. So um, some of the natural questions are that, where does the information about the collapsing matter go? Um, and I will try and answer to this, uh, I'll, I'll try and give some answers to this in the upcoming slides, but to be honest, this is something you'll hear a lot more from the uh, uh, sessions afterwards. And um, this is, in, in, in some ways, this is still matter in, in investigation. This once, if we can solve this problem, we have actually, we'll actually manage to solve the information paradox problem. But I'll talk about various ways in which we can rephrase the question and make it more accessible. Another interesting question, which of course some of you might ask is, what happens to this case when I just say, you, you, you take a string of paper and write some alphabets on it. What happens if you just burn the paper? I just heat the paper and it starts burning. Then even then I lose information about what was written on it. I forgot, I, I cannot, I cannot uh, see in practice whether it was alpha or beta, but I'm just seeing final ash or something that was left after the burns. Is this the same thing about, or is this also 
falling in the regime of information paradox? And the answer is no, this is not falling in the regime of information paradox because whenever we talk about the information paradox, we always think of um, whether you can recover information in principle or not. And when you do end up just burning a paper by, by, by heating it or something, in principle, you can re you, you, you can reverse time and get back the paper again. When I say reverse time, I don't mean that you actually have to build a time machine or something to do it. I just mean that you can play around with mathematical operators and wherever you used, you previously used notions of moving forward in time. All you have to do now is use a notion which takes you backward in time. And um, that, should, that should just recover the string of alphabets on that paper for you and even tell you the state of the paper before that, whether that you know, once the paper was empty and then somebody was writing on it. it. All of this is perfectly fine in that. However, the problem, if you, if you try and do this trick of time reversal in black holes, you end, up, you end up running into way too many problems. You end up running into the singularities and so on. And then you have to really worry about the structure of a black hole then. And such a simple trick does not work anymore. So uh, yeah, that's, 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 anyway, this is, this is all to just summarize what we mean by information and what it, what the simple notion of information loss looks like. Are there any questions at this point? I, yeah, Chandrabali, can we think of a thought experiment that can clarify this idea of um, information loss in black hole? Um, yeah, I mean, um, well, just, just, just think of two, two, two different chairs. The one is red in color and the other is blue in color. Or you can think of two, two different people you're not too sympathetic with. And then just think of crushing them and making and, and, then, and then forming a black hole out of that. So for example, if you started with the chairs, where one would be red and the other is blue, and you just think of crushing them and forming a black hole. And then if, say, an observer who's me, who's just looking at the final black hole states, I won't be able to tell which black hole was formed from the red colored chair and which one was formed from the blue colored chair. Um, so that's 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 the basic idea of information loss. Of course, these all have been refined with time, and then people have asked more questions about whether this information is present here and there, and so on. And we look, uh, we will look at that as the core in the upcoming slides. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right. So uh, okay, great. So moving on. Right. So now now let's come to the. Um, I think the, the, the famous um, um, famous topic of Hawking radiation. So what exactly is the computation that Hawking did? Um, so what Hawking did was he computed the spectrum of black hole radiation. And what this means, is, this is just some fancy word, but what this means is he just thought of some particles being present near the black hole and then just computed the energy of the particles as a function of frequency and you just end up getting some graph like this. It's it just it's just something, at least in his time, it was just understood as something that mathematics just spits out for you. Um, you, you just use some basic notions of uh, something called quantum field theory and you do this wonderful calculation and it just spits out this answer. Of course, we don't need to go into all these details to see what the paradox in the end is, but the nice thing about this curve is that it exactly looks like a thermal spectrum. And I should, at this moment, I, I should really put a caution on this word exactly, but to a very good approximation, it looks like a thermal spectrum. Um, in fact, back in the day, back in uh, 1960s and so or 1970s and so on, of course I wasn't born. Um, I, think, I think they really thought of this as a thermal spectrum. It's only recently that the word exactly has been um, put in quotes. So anyway, now, a thermal spectrum is, again, nothing very fancy. It just, it just tells you that if you have a thermal bath, uh, by a thermal bath, I mean you just, you just, you just, you just take a bath and you um, heat it to some temperature, and you put some brownian particles in it, you just put some particles, so on, then, you know, through, through the motion and so on, you can understand that there's some notion of a temperature associated. Uh, and that's, that's the only thing you need to understand from a thermal bath. But if you have a thermal spectrum, there exists the notion of a temperature. Um, and this equation is, I think it's remarkable because it's one of the very few equations and possibly the first equation which combine, the, which combine many subjects together. Um, 
for example, that's and, 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 and by the way, I promise that this is the only page that has equations in my slides, or at least I hope so. Um, and this this h bar is something that is you know what, what that describes the quantum nature of the object, and it's really small. By really small, I mean that in the standard units one uses, this is of the order ten power minus thirty four. Um, of course, if you are a physicist even have been uh, studying even some, some basic amount of physics, then you, you'll realize that these are just taken as one, but let's not do that. So in general, it's 10 power minus 34, and it's, that, it, it's, it's, it's a very small number. And CQ is denoting the speed of light. And this represents some constraints coming from special relativity that um, you've got this presence of CQ in here. Then eight pi is, okay, this, this is an important constant, but it doesn't have any, huge physical significance for us at the moment. And then there's G Newton, which is the Newton's gravitational constant. It tells you how strong uh, two objects attract to each other uh, because of the gravitational force. It's, it's one of the first things one studies in, uh, in, in school, in fact, when you have to compute the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the amount of time Earth takes to rotate around the sun and so on. And then KB is a thermodynamic property it tells you something about the thermodynamic properties. It, it has a name, it's called the Boltzmann constant. And M is the mass of the black hole. So, of course, I'm assuming that in this case, the black hole is only parameterized by a mass. So we have got a simple equation. And it's, um, again, like I said, it's, it's, it's kind of a remarkable equation as it combines many concepts at the same time. And um, just to understand the values of this deep, deep black hole, if you, write them all down in the standard units. This, this has something like this. It, it looks like six into 10 power eight Kelvin. Kelvin is not very different from Celsius. For those of you who are not familiar with Kelvin, it's not very different from what Celsius is. It's the exact same thing, up to some uh, plus minus 200, a factor of 200. And um, so, so this temperature just happens to be this number, six into 10 power minus eight, times the mass of sun, the sun which we have, uh, by the mass of the black hole. So I think the mass of the sun is around um, um, 10 power 30 kilograms or something, if I remember correctly. And uh, so, yeah, you, you've got the mass of sun by the mass of black holes. Um, and in general, it's a very small number because any kind of black hole that we have is, is, is I mean, this, this M is, is of the order, I think, um, a billion solar masses or something. M sun is also called a solar mass. So this M I think is of the order of a billion solar masses for all the black holes if you've observed that Chris was talking about. So it's a very small number. So, you know, it's, which is fine. You don't, you don't really have to worry about it. The only time you have to worry about, you might have to worry about this is when the black hole becomes very small. So if you have a very tiny black hole, who's, uh, you know, where M is of the order more than 10 power eight, uh, times the mass of sun, only then you have to worry about that. Um, and, and yeah, you can of course understand that that's a very uh, tiny and small black hole, but you don't have to worry about that for too long because since the black hole is emitting this radiation, it's, it's really, it's really uh, you know, throwing out particles off, it starts evaporating. By that I mean, since, you, you know, since, since the black hole is throwing out particles, it loses mass and then it shrinks and eventually, it shrinks to nothingness. Um, and that's called the time of evaporation for a black hole. And it happens after a huge amount of time when we think of big black holes. So if you think of black holes Chris was talking about, then you know this number comes to, I think, of order 10 by 85 years, 10 by 85 years, which is a huge number and clearly not something that one has to worry about for many number of lifetimes and possibly even the lifetime of Earth or even the lifetime of sun, in fact. So it's it's perfectly fine to not worry about this number. But again, if but again, if this mass was very uh, small, you would have a large temperature. But again, as you see here, if the mass is very small, then the evaporation time just goes to zero. So you don't have to worry about that for too long. So yeah, are there any questions at this point? Yeah. So it is really a big number. The lifetime of black holes so it's like yes. there are black holes which have like millions of uh, so to billions millions to billions of solar masses and we even for one solar mass black hole we we might not uh, we're most probably not going to see them evaporate how about uh other uh, small black holes which we 
can actually see them evaporating and uh, if even if there aren't like can we is there any way in which we can make them you mean externally make them evaporate and force it to evaporate faster is that what you mean no make small black holes and then allow it to evaporate in a day oh, oh um well it's in principle maybe yes but i don't think we have the current technology to do so even i mean at, at some point of course there was a huge hoopla about you know whether whether running experiments in the lhc or so on would form tiny black holes and whether that would eat up earth or something and that's all just rubbish that's that's that just can't happen um so i mean you, even if you did end up forming a black hole with the amount of energy you get at the lhc it would evaporate in less than a few seconds or something so you you should you don't have to you don't have to even worry about uh, something like that first of all it it can't it's it's not going to form something like that so even, making even, tiny black holes doesn't mean it would destroy the earth is that what you're saying no no yeah it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't mean that yeah all right so there are no more questions uh maybe let's go to the next slide all right so now i'm going to uh, try and talk about something which i was really afraid to talk about in the beginning so i must say this is the part which had worried me the most because i do not know of very nice ways of explaining unitarity without going to math so let me try my best so um right um y'all are familiar with even if you've not seen it in equations but you all are familiar with the day to day time evolution of various things which goes on around you and one of the simplest things or simplest models that we think of is the pendulum you just you stick a take a bob of uh, some mass and you attach it to a string and you just make it oscillate and it has something called a time period you know that it's going to come back to the same point of course that since that's real in in real world you have friction um it's it's eventually going to dissipate energy and then become uh, come to rest but even then the important thing is that its motion is completely deterministic right? and what i mean by this is that if i tell you the velocity and the position of the pendulum blob at some particular time then in principle i should be able to figure out its motion at any other point of time and that's what determinism means that there is a definite answer to the following question what is the position of the pendulum at a later time given its position is xyz at this moment if you ask a question like this you're going to receive a number however if you ask a question like this to a person who practices quantum mechanics he or she will be mad at you because it doesn't make any sense uh, in quantum mechanics you're not you don't have this notion of determinism anymore the main reason is that you know you again usually we, tip, we typically think of quantum mechanics as something which has to do with some very small distances and and so on and it just becomes very hard to make measurements which which work there so um you you end up making you end up having a different notion of making measurements in fact the whole theory is built on it's it, it doesn't it's, it's it's not built on determinism but it's rather built on probabilistic measurements and what i mean by that is that um the correct kind of question to ask then is that what is the probability that the ball is at position say 100 meters if it started with some velocity of uh, 20 meter per second at some point uh, x so that's the kind of question you can ask in quantum mechanics that what's 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 the what's the probability of understanding where the ball is after some time um and the the, the and when you ask a question like that and you want to then think about how you um, ask a question at a later time that how you, that is how you take a system and then let it just flow with time that's that's what's called time evolution and that's governed by the principle of unitarity and it's this this principle is very constraining in general and one one of the main constraints that introduces is that it conserves the probability that is the total probability of finding the ball at some point no matter after how long is always one the ball doesn't disappear um and most good kind of evolution preserves unitarity okay any 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 kind of evolution that one is familiar with even the first two or maybe the first one or two courses in quantum mechanics that preserves unitarity um so yeah i'm i'm going to talk a little more about the kind of states and so on in the next slide but if there are some questions or comments now 
Yeah, so no, this is, th thanks for a great like um, explanation of unitarity, um, Chandra Modi. So um, one example of where uh, where um, unitarity um, is very important actually is actually the universe around us. So in the early universe, um, the the physics that we do and sort of physics I do on a daily basis is I use this um, idea of unitarity to work out. Um, possible ways that the early universe could have evolved to give us the structure that we see around us today. So even the biggest structures in the, the universe around us today are constrained by this property of unitarity. So it's a very important concept in physics um, and it's very powerful as well. Um, so although like the idea of um, all probabilities have to add up to one might seem fairly basic, it's very, very powerful. Right. Right. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Angela, for that uh, for that uh, for that comment. And, and it's indeed 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 true that this often just imposing the fact that you should have such basic constraints give you a lot of constraints in how you go on formulating theories. Uh, and one example is, of course, in cosmology that that that, that, that was just stated. All right, great. So now let's proceed to the next one. Okay. So now I'm finally going to. We are, we are very close to the uh, close to the original statement of the information paradox, but there's just one more concept preventing us from uh, declaring it now, and um, that's the notion of the kind of states we have to think of. Okay, so I think point one was something I already tried saying it in the previous slide. Let me just repeat it now because it's going to be important. In quantum mechanics, we deal with probabilities, and one has to specify something like a state and then evolve it. Now, the notion of a state in quantum mechanics actually has a deeper meaning. It, in, in classical mechanics, you would just think of the state of a system as just being something like the position and momentum of a particle which is moving. However, in quantum mechanics, you just don't think of definite numbers of that kind, but you actually end up thinking about some vectors of some sort. Uh, those vectors live in some space, it's called the Hilbert space. These, at the moment, are just some fancy names. Feel free to Google it up later and look it up. But we don't need to go into all those body details. Um, and for us, we just we just we just think of quantum mechanics as, as just some probabilistic evolution of some simple things called states. And uh, now, now I'm going to tell you a fact which you have to accept, and that's that's the and and, and that fact is, you know, that a thermal spectrum is is an example of something called a mixed state. Um, so there are basically two kinds of states that we, that we often associate with. One is a pure state and the other is a mixed state. A pure state is something which is probability conserving. I mean, the evolution of a pure state is something that conserves probability. However, a mixed state is something which often introduces unwanted interactions. By, by unwanted interactions, I don't mean that it's ugly or it's bad or something. It's in fact, the most common thing that we encounter every day but it's, 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 it's just that it's ugly from a theoretical point of view. Just think of this ugliness as the same thing how you think about friction. You know, friction is something that we hate while doing calculations, but we know that it has to exist and it's the most common thing that's always present. So, okay, now I'll try and give you some more intuition of what this thing means from this diagram. So um, imagine that there's some system and I'm just taking a snapshot of that system at some time t equal to zero. And I just end up seeing blue dots at various points. Now, these blue dots don't represent particles of some sort. They actually represent, in some sense, the, um, uh, the I mean, they, 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 they represent the um, distribution of energies of, uh, in, in that system. But for now, just think of them as blue dots. And then after some time, Let's, let's say I wait for one second and then I click, uh, then I click a picture, I just get another kind of thing where there are many more brown dots. So pure state is just like thinking about one single dot, something which is, you know, is, it's, you can just specify the energy state of that system and then you just think of one of those single dots and then that it evolve. And that's just going to remain a single dot always. So if I just take a single blue dot and then let it evolve, that's just going to go to another single brown dot. However, if I think of a mixed state, what ends up happening there is that I end up having many of these blue dots and all of them talk to each other. So kind of, so, so you know, that kind of distributes various kinds of uh, stuff 
in in something like emotion and it just it 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 often what happens is you end up getting a different distribution after some time a different distribution of energy after some time so that's what a mixed state is but the important point the only thing that you need to focus on is that quantum mechanics tells you uh, and from the intuitive picture as you see is that a pure state can never evolve to a mixed state by following the process of unitary time evolution so if you start with a pure state if you start with a single blue dot you'll never end up getting multiple brown dots and um that's that's the basic problem which you know in some slight technical words which is behind the information paradox that unitary evolution of pure states does not lead to a thermal spectrum which is a special case of a mixed state what specializes the thermal spectrum is is the nice way in which the energy is distributed in these blue dots so in a general mixed state is having some random distribution of energy but a thermal state has some nice distribution so yeah so, before going to point to yeah if, if there are questions please go ahead just to clarify what exactly this mixed state is so let's say uh so as uh, the state is described by wave function if yes. i take two states psi1 and uh, psi2 and i also flip a coin and if it lands on heads i prepare a system in the first state psi1 and if the coin uh, lands on tails then i'm going to prepare this uh, system in the state in the second state psi2 and so let's say i uh, flip a coin and i this depending on if it's heads or tails i prepare a, a system in the respective state and i give it to you and uh, you mean to say that you would be describing that state uh, the system with a mixed state rather than a pure state and exactly. so bas so basically by mixed state you just mean that uh, the classical probabilities or for a system to be in different states like it's uh 45% probable uh, probabilities like 45% for it to be in this one and uh, 55% to be in a different state is that what you mean by a mixed state um yeah that's that that's 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 the basic notion in fact in fact the, the example which you gave is more accurate the to the correct definition but if you know you toss a coin and then you have two two particular spins which are interacting with each other and then you prepare the system in one state depending on whether it's heads or tails so that's 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 the correct example of the mixed state i didn't want to go into those complications as of now but that's right that's that's how one should actually think about this thank you yes. and 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 again the basic idea is that if i if i just give you a state which was always spin up then or maybe say both spins are always up then that could never go into something which you know which was whose fate was decided by the fate of throwing a coin so that's the idea that if you try and evolve a pure state that can never go into something which is a mixed state so all right so thanks thanks for that uh, excellent that's excellent point right so now this is the old version of the paradox um, as it stated we've developed all the tools that we need to state it and this is the basic point that why do we end up getting a thermal spectrum um which only depends on very few properties where one of them is mass from the collapsed object by evolving a pure state so if i start with some pure state and it collapses it onto a black hole why is it that i end up getting a mixed state and that's something that is not explained by typical quantum mechanics and um and right this is this is the old old version of the paradox and i should say that the you know the present status of this question is that it can be answered there are uh, there's there's um, i mean one one can resolve this question by by doing some uh, some slight modifications to um the word exactly in here one has to modify what they mean by the word exactly and then one can actually try and understand how point 2 is resolved but then there are more deeper questions so what happens um after the black hole evaporates completely where does the information go can we see the information in the final burst like the black hole is evaporating and if there's a final burst of radiation can we see the information up there or is the information contained within the radiation um and i should say that all of these will be i think answered in some more detail in the upcoming episodes so as of now this is just trying to build up to that and i should end with uh, at least end uh, the section with the uh, with, with with some with some notion which is so called the modern version of the information paradox and this actually crucially depends on something i alluded to in the first slide so let me just go back quickly to that now 
it's this picture. You know, I said that the black hole has a horizon, and that's something which forms, which which is which is a distinguishing feature of between a black hole and many other bodies. And is this important in the information paradox? And the answer is yes. It's actually very important that you think of this horizon as something special, and um, you, you think of uh, at least at least uh, you, you 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 then have to worry about this horizon a lot, and entanglement, which is a name in quantum mechanics and something you might have heard of a lot, plays a very crucial role in trying to um, formulate the modern version of the paradox, and uh, that's 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 the kind of status. As there in uh, 2021, that the modern versions of the paradox are actually formed using entanglement. So, all right. Uh, by the way, are there any more questions for this slide? Yeah. Can you also uh, say why exactly is this called a paradox? Usually, a paradox is uh, conflicting uh, things between two things that we think is true. And uh, what are the two things over here that's conflicting with each other? Right. Right. Okay. Great. So. Uh, um, um, Thanks for the question. So, um, one, one, I mean, okay, the, the one, one, one point where that's really visible is point two. That is one of your looking at us. That is, you start with a pure state and you end up getting a mixed state or a formal state. And that shouldn't happen according to the laws of quantum mechanics. Um, so, that's one way in which there's a conflict. The second way in which there's a conflict is that you cannot really think of time, you know, reversing back time and then thinking about what exactly collapsed into the black hole, whether you collapsed a chair of 100 kgs into the black hole or you collapsed a table of 100 kgs into the black hole. You, you won't be able to answer that by just reversing back time. And reversing back time is something that is just possible by unitary time evolution. So usually we think of unitary time evolution as something which, which takes us forward in time. But you can also think of unitary time evolution in the opposite direction as something that takes reverse, you know, backwards in time. And um, that should that should in principle um, allow you to get back information, but in this case, it just runs into problems. So these are a few reasons why it's called a paradox. And of course, again, like I said, there are more modern versions of the same question. But yeah, this is these are the basic uh, reasons, at least in this particular slide, which I will get to. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I see. Okay. So you. So this, uh, these problems like they come because general relativity and quantum mechanics don't go hand in hand. It's it's exactly. If if you, I mean, one one of the best things to do would be to try and do this calculation in the full theory of something called quantum gravity. But we don't we don't really have a good hold on that. Any any approach to that, um, including some approaches of Wheeler and Devitt, have just uh, not really given us good 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 ways of handling it as they just make a way too complicated but you know people have thought of various ways of doing it cool okay so yeah so it we we get this information paradox um for black holes but um why can't we just say that black holes are these exotic um things uh, which lead to this information paradox but everything else is governed by like sensible quantum mechanics why can't that be the case Good, because um, um, good, good. Uh, first of all, it's 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 not quite true that you don't have to um, you 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 don't have to uh, I mean uh, worry about things beyond the traditional quantum mechanics or other things like even in cosmology you, you often have to worry about effects which come you know from from some uh, effects of quantum gravity and and really this problem is not about just quantum mechanics, but both quantum mechanics and general relativity playing a role hand in hand. And um, this this problem actually boils down to whether we have a good understanding of quantum gravity or not. And it's in if one could um, try and understand that theory in some detail, then one would be able to solve it. But one reason why we care about this is if we just impose the basic laws of quantum mechanics and think of gravity as behaving in some slight you know, in some classical manner, in the, in the usual, in the usual notion that we are familiar with, then not only that it, it's 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 not only true that we end up with this uh, these kind of paradoxes, but it's also true that you end up getting things which make no sense at some point. Uh, you 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 end up getting you end up getting some notions like 
maybe if you cross the horizon, quantum mechanics is dead, or if there's some fire which just burns you up when you cross the horizon, and so on. And um, it, this this just is a playground for such things. For 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 even the internal consistency of the theory, you would have to try and answer these things or understand these things in more detail. Um, so uh, yeah, I. That's 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 the best thing I can say right now. I mean, even if you didn't worry about black holes and only thought of them as exotic objects, that would not suffice because um, even as some simple thought experiments which don't involve black holes and just involve the notions of quantum mechanics and gravity together, you would run into trouble. So, did that answer your question or? Yeah, no, uh, thank you so much. All right, great. All right, so um, now, of course, this is a natural question to ask whether black holes are really black. And the answer is no, as from what we have seen on the previous slides, that they actually glow with Hawking radiation. We cannot see it in reality, of course. It would be weird if we could see it. But uh, we, I mean, see just in, uh, through, our, uh, through, through our bad eyes. Um, but in any way, again, as a theorist, I'm allowed to use the word in principle as often as I want to. So as in principle, they glow with Hawking radiation. And I think this is an excerpt from this um, from this movie called The Theory of Everything, which was uh, which was of course was um, um, which which was a good movie on this the person Stephen Hawking, and that's uh, it's kind of remarkable. And I, I should say I personally have taken lots of motivation from uh, Stephen in, in, in various different things, especially that he was able to you know, fight his illness and give us such wonderful physics all through uh, these years. And I think he even wrote papers uh, in 2017 and 18, which was kind of remarkable because uh, that's, I mean, that's that that's something that many of us would not, you know, imagine uh, as being possible. And I think in this, I, 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 there was some lectures she gave, I think, uh, sometime in in not too a distant past, where he actually said this wonderful quote that black holes aren't as black as they are painted. They're not eternal prisons that they were once thought. Things can get out of the black holes, both on the outside and possibly to another universe. This is the Hawking radiation that we, of course, talked about, which she discovered back then. So if you ever feel like you're in a black hole, don't give up. There's a way out. And I think this is something he really has shown us on how to do. But even though you might have various illnesses, which are there in your life, or you might have lost a loved one or something, and then it's it's a, it's a terrible situation. But the important thing is to never give up. And I think in this difficult time of the pandemic, it's really uh, important that we remember such things. So, if uh, but of course, there's it's it's not always easy to fight it ourselves. We are often not having the determination and will that Stephen did. Uh, so it's 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 often very useful to. Uh, Talk to you know people who are maybe um, suffering through similar things, or you know discuss even some basic issues like you know being stuck at research for over six months with like-minded people who are often physicists next door. But in this time of the pandemic, you can't meet them in person. But what you can do is actually you can meet them online, and there's this uh, beautiful session which is um, organized by Dr. Andrea Welsh, and uh, there's this mental health and physics support group which is I think open to academic members and non-academic members, irrespective of who you are, you, should, you can always try and meet up. And there's this Slack channel which you, uh, which you can join. I think, uh, uh, yeah, this, uh, this, this link will be put in the description. And um, yeah, so if you ever feel that, you know, you need to talk to people, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. I think many of us are open to uh, talking if you feel like there's some trouble. And of course, feel free to join such groups which uh, often help you share your uh, problems. And with that, I would like to end my talk and thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you, Tandra Moli, for um, a great talk and for such a touching ending. And I guess to sum up, this has been episode one of Black Hole Wars at the Cambridge Science Festival, brought to you by myself, Eingrin Tavanason, Rifat Khan, uh, Christopher Reynolds, and Chandra Moli Chowdhury himself. Um, if you uh, like this talk you might want to check out the other upcoming episodes in this series of podcasts on the black hole information paradox where we'll be talking about cool things such as fuzzballs entanglement entropy 
and holography. So thanks for watching and bye.